So welcome of the rise of the Super Bean podcast. My name is Vanderson Pires and today my guest is Jace Tepato. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a quick note. Uh, the sponsor of this episode is Combat Room Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So if you're in Wellington or in other cities around, around New Zealand and you want to learn Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, in a safe environment, meet cool people and learn a really powerful skill. Come to see me and my team at combatroom.co.nz. <laughs> How are you, Fred, brother? I'm so I'm really good and I'm really pleased to have you here today. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thanks uh, for having me. I become aware of you because we we have lots of things in common, and Why? one of the things it's the um, we are ambassadors of Float Well, right? What's what's amazing thing? I do like to ask you a few questions about that. Yes. And also, um, I just watched your TED talk. It was very, very powerful. I think it um, has something so powerful about uh, being vulnerable. And you just had that, uh, you know, that moment. Uh, and it was so um, powerful to to listen and to, to watch that. So how was that experience for you, Jess? Jace. TED Talk was on the day it's probably the calmest I've ever been mm. to be honest like there's a lot of I suppose pressure when you hear the words TED Talk because it's going to be there forever and probably beyond me and mm. when I pass it'll still be available online I'm sure somewhere Yes. but I felt really prepared I felt really clear about what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, thank you for acknowledging being vulnerable, but uh, I've been doing a lot of work as I know you have been doing personal growth work. Um, mm -hmm. I was brought up in a spiritual environment, uh, environment, so being able to express myself emotionally has always been supported. Mm -hmm. So to be able to do that in front of people and in quite a kind of larger arena was uh, actually quite empowering for me it allowed for me to express I hadn't really expressed about my brother passing last year um, really how impactful that was on me mm -hmm. and also my career and how it activated my career and kind of the pathway of where I'm heading I feel helping children with mindfulness and as well as adults at my yoga studio mm -hmm. But I, you know, I really loved it. I met some amazing people. I, I had such great feedback on the day from people who were sitting in the audience. And the best thing I heard was from a huge guy, like tattooed, kind of like us, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he came straight up to me and afterwards and he's crying, which uh, to me was like really uh, powerful. And it, uh, he said, I, I, the first thing he said to me is, I don't cry. Mm. <laughs> so without even saying his name, and he, he was like, you, your story really impacted me. It resonated with me because I uh, had so much in common with you. My dad left. Uh, my brother was sick. My brother's still alive. But uh, you being able to share that about your brother and how much his ill health impacted you really made me face my fears mm. about my brother dying and about taking better care of myself mm. my head my mental health and well-being and my emotional well-being mm -hmm. so thank you were his words to me thank yeah, you yeah. for waking me up for letting me be able to express how i feel to you right now <laughs> mm, yeah yeah and uh, and for inspiring other people to do the same with your work. Mm -hmm. And I felt really humbled and honoured that he would do that for me. So, yeah. I mean, that speaks volumes. So, Jason, just for the audience, for the ones who haven't seen your TED Talk, could you please tell a little bit the, the story about your brother and your father and how you managed to heal um, this this relationship with your father in your brother your brother didn't. Right. So how was how was this process for you? Well, the I suppose the we should start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my dad left 
when I was two and my brother had just been born, he broke up with my mum. So part of that story I didn't share in TED Talk. I never met my mum until five years ago. And so 40 years not knowing your mum uh, is pretty, that's pretty intense. But I was brought up by my grandparents. And my little brother and I were brought up whangai, as we say in Māori, by our grandparents. It was an amazing upbringing. I don't feel like I uh, missed anything. In fact, now that I've healed my relationship with my father, he says, you were better off with them because they had everything you needed and I was still a kid. Um, but what does that do to kids when you, you... That was my first memory. I remember seeing Dad leave and never come back. Mm-hmm. And so within me that instilled beliefs that I wasn't worthy and as I grew up I worked, found out that he went and had another family, didn't take me or my brother with him. And so I grew to really hate, I know that I don't like that word, but really hate my dad just based on the fact that he went and had another family and didn't take me and my brother. And I would say about six years ago, before I came back to New Zealand, I did a, um, I'd been doing yoga and meditation for many years by then, uh, and I just realized that I needed to heal my relationship with dad. I'm fast forwarding this because I could be here all day, (laughs) but, uh, and I did, I came home, I healed my relationship with dad, I rang him and said, look, first thing I said to him was, I'm sorry. I've blamed you my whole life and uh, it hasn't gone well for me. (laughs) Wow. How was this conversation? I was intense. We were both crying. Mm. And I I admitted to him, I said, you know, all I've ever wanted is for you to say you love me and my brother. And my grandparents were his parents. So I did used to see him at like funerals and stuff, but just avoid him because I didn't want to have anything to do with him. He was, he was the guy that left and never paid any attention to me and my brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, we just both cried. And when I said to him, all I ever wanted, you know, I'm 39 when this happened, this conversation happened. Uh, I, when I said to him, all I ever wanted was for you to say, you love me. His words to me were, all I ever wanted was for you to say that you love me. Wow. Mm. Whoa. Goosebumps. And you you only ever think of your side of the story as the hurt guy who was left by dad. But to hear him, I was living in Australia over the phone, like (laughs) sobbing and, you know, struggling to breathe i was like whoa i never thought that there was another side of the story mm-hmm. and that's where he came clean and said you were better off with your grandparents when you were born i was uh 19 when your brother was born my little brother uh i was 21 so by 21 i'd had three children because i also had a adopted brother out mm-hmm. when he was 17 so there's three of us that he'd left behind Coming back to my brother, he didn't have, I suppose, the tools of yoga and meditation or his own personal growth work, let's call it, that I had done while I was away in Australia to heal the way that I did with dad. Mm -hmm. Uh, And how I explain it in the TED Talk is... It manifested that heartbreak, let's call it, manifested in his mind. So his mind wasn't healthy. Uh, It manifested in his body, like he was um, probably two times the size of me, even though we are the same height. Mm -hmm. And uh, he passed away last year uh, of a burst aorta because his heart couldn't literally a broken heart, his heart couldn't manage the weight anymore. Mm. Two days before, I never shared this though, but two days before he passed, my father found out about him being in hospital and and we knew that it probably wasn't looking good. So we told dad, even though dad hadn't spoken to my brother for years. And dad came up to hospital 
and I thought there was going to be a bit of a standoff. But there was really beautiful healing. And my brother said, oh my God, all I ever wanted was for dad to hug me. And I didn't tell him about what dad had said to me a few years before, but mm, the way that I feel uh, it all played out was that it was healing was healing for both of them and it was there was kind of an, an uh, out of a sad situation my brother passing away it was a it was a yeah a beautiful healing moment before he did mm-hmm. uh, for me too mm. for me too mm. and how yoga and meditation helped you on this in this gen so how did you start how did you start practicing yoga yeah I used to be a professional dancer and 16 years ago I was in a show uh, overseas Mm -hmm. and I was exhausted (laughs) (laughs) and you know how guys we like to push ourselves to the limit Mm -hmm. and I know you probably do the same thing too. (laughs) Uh, I'm learning, I'm learning but uh, I was in South Africa and I had to go to the doctor because I had a sty on my eye, I had a cold sore on my lip, Mm -hmm. I was deaf in one ear and the guy said to me, the doctor said, whatever you are doing you need to go to bed and rest because your body is tired and you just need to sit down. I just stubbornly said no, (laughs) I've got one more week left of shows dancing uh, and then I did I went to work that night and I ripped my eye Kelly's wow I know <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh not that can I ever compare myself to an athlete but when all you know is how to use your body and that's your job and that's was my identity mm-hmm. it made me realize it literally set me on my bum because I was in a cast for 12 weeks to heal I couldn't do anything. I was pretty depressed, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, And a friend of mine said, suggested I do um, meditation. Tried it. It was terrible. (laughs) (laughs) Actually made it worse because I was quiet and I was with my thoughts. Mm -hmm. But then after uh, I got out of the cast, the physio said to me, you should do yoga. I think it will be really good for you. It's low impact. It'll start to stretch the tissue at the back of your heel so your Achilles will heal. Mm-hmm. And I did. And uh, I loved it for the physicality at first. But then I also loved how I felt after it made my mind quieter as well as the physical benefits of it. Mm-hmm. I just fell in love with it. So that was 16 years ago. Wow. And then I, uh, it's, I think it was the stillness that I really loved. Mm-hmm. It's like when I'm, you know, because you use your body a lot. When I'm in my body, I feel really present. When I'm in my body as a dancer, it was my way of expressing myself. When I do yoga or the physical practice of yoga, I feel like really embodied is the words that I use. Uh, in my body and present and I can listen to my breath and everything slows down so no matter how fast my life seems it's like it's real quiet Mm. yeah it's so interesting because we normally um, learn how to move but it's we don't learn how to stay still and that's the hardest part and now you run a really very successful studio it's Afi Mm. yoga and well-being right you got it man yeah yeah so mm-hmm. please tell, tell a little bit about your studio so what what type of work you do there thank you yeah we rebranded last year we're almost uh well, we're just over a year old and we rebranded to my business partner and i justine himmel uh rebranded to afi afi in maori means to help or support Yoga and well-being. Now, in this Western society, which is a little bit, I call it Instagram yoga, where people, I've been guilty of this in the past, mm-hmm. take pictures of them in really full-on postures and that's yoga. Mm-hmm. And it is, like some some of it is yoga, but the physical practice of yoga, like what you people see is people doing handstands and splits on Instagram, is a very small part of yoga. And yoga to me is a beautiful... Um, 
methodology and sets of philosophies that allow us to be better humans is the easiest way I can mm -hmm. uh, describe it. Yoga and well-being, we use the word, words well-being because our business is based on people come to move their body. So to move your body, to get embodied in your body, <clears throat> to quieten the mind as well with meditation and with the quieter practices like yin, uh, to heal your soul or your spirit. And then when those three things are in good shape, I suppose, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. It informs our connection to other people. So we can be better humans, connected to other humans better because we're in a good space ourselves. In Māori, we call that hauora. Hauora, there's four walls, what I just mentioned, the body, the mind, the soul, and your connection to other people. And I, I love yogic philosophies because they are what my nanny and my koro taught me growing up, Māori. So Māori and yoga, or now I realize that we were just talking about this before, uh, Māori and Buddhism or Māori and Taoism or Māori and any of, of those wisdom teachings mm -hmm. say the same thing. Yeah, the core is the same. Exactly the same. So that's what we do at Afi. Um, we've got a people say this but i don't really re within maori we uh we call out we call afi our whare or the house mm -hmm. so you take your shoes off when you get there and <laughs> afterwards we've got the tea on so normally we would feed you if you came like if you came to my house brother i'd feed you <laughs> but um we know that would probably send us out of business if we try to feed everyone but we always have a cup of tea on and um always tea and uh there's an area where people sit and that's really big. We call it Māori Manaki, like to take care of your guests. So whenever you come, you're a guest in my whare. Whenever you come, I'll take care of you, your well-being. Whenever you come, you might come for the physical, but also if you need it, I'll give you a hug. <laughs> uh, our teachers will te stay afterwards and talk to you if you've got any questions. We've got a big couch area where people sit. An example, the other day, I finished teaching at 8 and at 9.30, I was like, okay, guys, I've got to go home. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get out. <laughs> I see that as a great problem to have. Yeah, yeah. Because it means people want to stay. Mm -hmm. If you're making people feel at home while they're taking care of their home, mm -hmm. themselves, then that, that I think is a, that's a measure of success. Like no money could ever replace that. Yeah, and that's that's very powerful. So if okay. someone that's listening now and uh, wants to try yoga, so what's what's your advice for? What's the first step for someone who would like to experience all those amazing benefits you're just explained to us? That. Yeah. So what's what's your advice? <laughs> Can I? There's two things actually. Uh, the first is. Forget what you see on Instagram about what yoga is mm. and forget this is in, with, wrapped up within that first bit. Yoga is not about touching your toes. <laughs> it's not about, I can't tell you how many people come in and they've never done yoga and they're like, oh, oh, I'm really scared because I can't touch my toes. I'm like, that doesn't matter. <laughs> There's a saying that, I, that, I, that always sticks with me when people say that it says yoga is not about touching your toes yoga is about how you're being on your way down there <laughs> mm, that's super powerful that's really interesting yeah so that that would probably be the first thing and i would just say like at our studio we teach there's no dogma meaning some yoga practices i've that i've practiced in the past um although i honor them are like one way and that's how you do it it's kind of like ballet where everything is all about technique and that's important but everyone is different like you look at every all the people that come you know tall short wide slim flexible not flexible all of it we've got the whole range mm. so we ask that you modify your practice according to you so it makes sense mm. so 
if you can't touch your toes, then bend your knees and use some props, use a block or, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and if anything, like the biggest compliment that I've got from people who have tried out yoga and like, oh my God, that's not what I thought it was. And I said, oh, well, what, what, what did you get from it then? And most people have said the breath mm. was learning how to breathe and noticing that I hold my breath. And when we try something new, when someone gives us instructions, they say, do this or hold your arms out and hold them there for 20 seconds. Most of us go, <gasps> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we don't breathe. Yeah, yeah. And so just bringing people's awareness to their breath does two things. It calms them down especially if they're shaking or they're challenged and it makes them present in the moment Mm -hmm. and then this one and then this one so if i can help people to breathe Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) yes that's amazing so talking about that you have this other amazing project the name is amy tree right so when you teach mindfulness yeah, for for children in schools. So how how that starts? How did it start? M three started. My brother who passed. Mm. I didn't add that he had eight kids. And this is before he passed away. So two years ago, he was sick. He had been sick for a while, like he was big for a while, and he was in and out of hospital. And they kept saying to him, "You got to lose some weight, otherwise you're gonna your health's gonna descend." and um, you know, no matter how much you help someone, like I was always saying to him, how, what can I do to help you, my bro? I'm in the fitness industry. I can help you. Mm-hmm. What What can I do? Ultimately, it comes down to them, right? Uh, well, his, his kids were suffering from him being unwell. And I said, because when he was sick, he couldn't. they couldn't come and stay with him. So they missed their dad. And I... I said to his youngest daughter, who at that time was seven, it's only two years ago, I said to her, how are you, my darling? She was like, oh, uncle, I'm not good. Which broke my heart, because, you know, seven-year-old, to have that awareness to answer in that way and be truthful about it Mm -hmm. was super powerful for me. And then... I also, I read a lot, I had read, um, it kept popping up, the statistics around how many children are taking antidepressant and anxiety medicine for their mental health and well-being. Since 2006, it's risen by 80%. Mm. So more of our children are relying on medicine to feel better, and that's not okay for, for me. When I'm in the business where I teach people or give people some tools to be able to manage themselves a little bit better. I taught a yoga class out at uh, the hut. One of my students at my yoga studio said to me, can you come and teach yoga? And I did. And I loved it. So M3 started that way. I just started off with a yoga class. But then I realized that these children (laughs) didn't know Maori mythology. You know, we live in New Zealand and there's some amazing stories in our culture that I was brought up with, that our children are missing. Even if they're from, you know, other countries, it's the sense of, you know, well, you belong here and you live here in New Zealand now, you know, here are some stories. They're really cool stories too. Mm. So I created M3 based on how my niece was feeling and based on those statistics and after having such a great time (laughs) teaching yoga to the children Mm -hmm. and I uh, so M3 is Maori stories so I teach the children a story movement teach the children movement to the stories so that they can remember the story because it's in their body and kids love to move. Yeah. And then the last M is mindfulness. So it's what I was saying to you before about breath. Mm-hmm. So simple, like making the children 
focus on their breath just slows them down, especially if they're feeling anxious, and brings them into the present moment. Because when they're in the present moment, they're likely to feel that sense of groundedness, of awareness, of attention. They can focus on the work that their teacher is giving them. Uh, They can make a wiser decision. An example is one of the children who was touted to be a bully. I shared this in my TED Talk. Uh, started doing my program and we call it Tahi Rua Toru Ha. So you breathe in Tahi Rua Toru for three and then you go all the way out. The kids don't need to know that someone's doing it. No one else needs to know that you're doing that, but it slows you down. And this bully was able to practice just that breathing uh, enough to slow him down so that he didn't punch a wall or another child and wow. changed his way of behaving now so now he now he protects other kids from the bullies <laughs> <laughs> amazing yeah i know it's pretty um mm. it's awesome stuff what's your what's a, can you can you please share one of the stories you use it to to teach the kids one of the yeah, yeah please what's what's your favorite <laughs> my favorite to teach and it doesn't, I teach, I speak te reo, so I mm-hmm. teach at, uh, at uh, te reo speaking schools. I love this story about Rata and the Totara tree. So Rata was, um, he was a teenager and he used to watch his family go out to fish. But they didn't have a big enough canoe mm-hmm. <laughs> to bring f- enough food back to feed the whole village. So he worked out pretty quick. If we don't have enough food, we're not going to survive. So he decided to help. So he went into the forest, he found a tōtara tree, the tallest tree in the forest, and he cut it down so he could start to make a waka, like a canoe big enough. Mm-hmm. And uh, it took him all day because it was so big, right, just to cut the tree down. He decided to come back the next day and then start carving out the canoe. But when he got back... The next day, the tree was standing back up. <laughs> and he was like, whoa, this is weird. Anyway, that continued for three days. And on the third day, he was like, I'm going to do something different. So instead of going home to rest and come back the next day, he hid behind a log. And he watched these mythical patupayere here in our language. They're called, they're like night fairies. He watched the insects of the forest. And I get really animated when I tell the kids. The insects of the forest, the birds of the forest, the animals of the forest all come together and put the whole tree back together again. So it stood up. <laughs> and he's like, what's going on? Why are you guys doing this? The patupaire, he said to him, Rata, you've got here means you've made a mistake. You haven't asked for permission from the god of the forest to cut down the tree. You haven't shown respect. Mm. And uh, the kids are like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, He said, well, I'm so sorry. Like, what can I do? (laughs) What can I do? Uh, You must appear. You must apologize to Tane Mahuta, god of the forest, and ask for permission so he did and he went and he said, sorry, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to help out my family and make a canoe big enough so that our family could be fed. And Tane Mahita gives him permission. He goes, I've only given you permission because you've shown respect. And which is the theme for the story. And the children, like by this stage, you know, like hanging on every word which is really beautiful to see because in that that in itself is mindful. Yeah, but it's such a great story. I'm here. Can you tell more, more, more? <laughs> <laughs> I know this. Yeah, I mean, but that's what I mean. Yeah. There's so many beautiful mm. stories that these kids these days, because there's so many things that our children have that they forget about. Um, it seems they've forgotten about telling these stories. Mm-hmm. So I love that. <laughs> That's so powerful. There, Thank there you. any story to talk about uh, 
um, being vulnerable um, about vulnerability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great. That's a great question. Yeah, I would say the story of Maui uh, and the fingers of fire. Maui was like a superhero. He's actually who I, who I, um, the kids say to me, are you Maui? Like when I describe his qualities and I go, yes, <laughs> but he's, uh, he's a bit cheeky like me. He's uh, half, this bit is not me, but he's half uh, Atua, meaning half God and half human. Mm -hmm. So he has superhuman powers uh, and he's able to do things that humans can't do. Um, he goes to uh, Mahawika, the goddess of fire, and she at first doesn't like him because he's so confident. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he realizes that he has to um, be humble and show humility, which isn't really vulner vulnerability. Um, let me have a think about that. There's mm. there's loads of beautiful stories and beautiful themes, but mm -hmm. that's certainly one that many of our Maori boys, yeah. our Maori men, or well, all men really can. Mm -hmm definitely benefit from mm. right <laughs> yeah that's awesome so Jason, talking about uh, vulnerability um i know you advocate a lot for um for mental health even i was explained to you before wh where the rise of the super being came from so um was the idea of bringing uh, people with some skills and some um knowledge to share to help uh, us to develop more um, emotional fitness with mm. the idea of uh, especially men no in New Zealand we have uh, you know this discussion going on about uh, men and you know the suicide and you know all those those bad things and especially because when men cannot uh, express themselves the language comes first it's violence you know so and you know that anger so what's what's your what's your advice for someone who has those type of problems. So first, why do you think this is so uh, prominent in our, our society those days? And how can we practice something or exercise something to be able to, especially men, to be more vulnerable, to open up more and respond less, being less... Um, um, reactive. Reactive, yeah. yeah. That's the... Mm. Well, I feel that we've learnt that behaviour from generations before. Well, if you go with the idea that men in their uh, identity, I suppose, back in caveman days was men hunt and gather and the woman stays home, I know that you, d you definitely couldn't use that vernacular these days. Mm -hmm. But it's ingrained in us, it's in our DNA that we are stiff up a lip and we're tough. And my people are a warrior people, your people are warrior people. So it's ingrained, it's within our DNA, it's gener intergenerational. What's happened over the years too is that we, with masculinity and with a big, in New Zealand specifically, focus on sport. And we have our heroes of the All Blacks, and you know the the bros come to my yoga studio. So I'm not speaking badly about them, but it's all of these masculine stereotypes that are our heroes. Let's call it that mm -hmm. for men. Uh, so we've been taught to hold it all together and not express yourself, and not if you're sad, express yourself. Now I was lucky because I was brought up by my grandparents, and although my grandfather was really stern and tough he'd, I'd also see him cry so I had some positive role models around um, someone a masculine real stern real strong uh, figure in my life I, I had both you know strong but also allowing yourself to express yourself so that you're not holding up that pent-up anger 
So I think it's, uh, I mean, it's we've learnt it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we keep having these male stereotypes that are, you know, these almost superhuman superhero figures. Uh, I think it's changing though. You've got more and more people bringing awareness to we've got a suicide problem in Aotearoa, especially with men, especially with Maori men. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we'll, we'll just by um, because you and I are having a conversation about it right now, more awareness is starting to happen around it. Mm-hmm. Your question was how can men, what's something simple that men can do to uh, deal with their stuff? Is well, I feel anger is actually the surface level emotion of something way deeper like fear or if we go right back it may have something to do with abandonment or or being told off when you were young like most of our stuff that we hold on to and comes up as a reaction started when we were young my anger came from my dad leaving it too my brother's anger came from dad leaving it too You could probably trace back if you've had anger in your life to where that happened in your life. Any male can. But as adults, we're not that, I'm not that two-year-old kid anymore. And I have awareness now. So two stages, I reckon, is notice if that anger has come up or if it's starting to boil. For me, I feel it in my belly. And then it rises up into my heart and it makes my heart pump. So I can feel it before anything happens. And now I call it the breath moment. It it would be like if you are in traffic, (laughs) like I was on the way here just before, and people cut you off or they're going slow and you want to get somewhere really quickly. You can feel your blood boiling and your rage rising. Opportunity in a car when it's just you (laughs) to practice. I call it the breath pause. So when you feel that, that's the first step. That's awareness. You can feel it rising in you. For me, it used to be not anymore. I haven't felt like this for a while, but it used to, I'd clench my fists, and that may be something, a a signal for some guys. And so then I would notice that first step and then take a breath for myself, a long breath. And then feel my fingers consciously start to open again so that my body relaxes. It's what I was speaking about before around those children. It brings, calms you down, the breath. It brings you back into the moment. In the moment, am I that two-year-old kid that where that anger comes from? No. In the moment, can I make a wiser decision about how to behave now, respond? Mm-hmm. That will not only affect myself, but everyone else involved. Yes, because I'm a 45-year-old man now, (laughs) not a two-year-old kid who feels hurt and abandoned and lost and not worthy. And that's a practice. That's, That's probably the third and most important step is practice. Every time I feel myself now, and I can go from one to ten very quickly, (laughs) <laughs> you <laughs> yes <laughs> uh and so i yeah i gotta practice mm. <laughs> i just yes. gotta practice mm. that's that's super powerful which which mm. story has has shaped your yourself you know to to be able to give you the the inspiration in in days like when you feel you didn't practice enough so do you have any story who um, inspired you to to keep this on this path and a story from my life yeah or from Maori mythology to stay the path to stay the course not really one in particular mm. but I think about in all wisdom teachings Buddhism, Taoism, yoga, Hinduism, um, they're all, they all have beautiful stories or philosophies or methodologies um, that create really themes 
that you and I can live a, a really beautiful life of love and compassion and kindness. Uh, and so I think about my ancestors, so no real story, one story. I think about my ancestors and how they paved the way for me to be here, how they left some beautiful stories, like the one I was sharing about Rata, like the ones about Maui, like the ones about, there's uh, one about in my meeting house back home where it was about this um, fish that was turned into the Tanifa of the Wanganui River that protected uh, protected his owner. You know, like things like that of guardianship of the... All of our ancestors left behind these beautiful stories for us to live our lives by. These uh, beautiful methodologies and philosophies to live our lives by. Uh, and what it drills right down to, like all of the themes, if you were to bundle them up and drill them down to one thing... What would it be? Love. Really. Mm. It's to be a loving human. <laughs> that's that's really powerful. Yes, if, if people want to know more about the work you're doing and who you are and be more in, in contact with, with you, so what's the what's the best way to, to contact you? I can I I know this is scandalous, but I I just wrote a post today on social media. As I have a strained relationship with social media, because uh, I'm an older generation right now, and and uh, and it's I still struggle. Although I understand social media is important, that's how we do things these mm -hmm. days. I still have to ask my nieces. Oh, you know, how do I? promote a story on on fa uh, Instagram or Facebook, and they're like, "Oh, like this, like this, uncle." Uh, <laughs> So um, social media, I suppose, is the quickest way. I realize having come clean, come out, <laughs> saying social media is hard for me. I also understand uh, how beneficial it is, mm -hmm. wider reach, quicker. So social media, um, I'm Jace Tepasu, is my name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then Afi Yoga. Afi Yoga. And then M3 Mindfulness for Children. Mm -hmm. That's um uh, a new ambassador for you know float well, what else? Uh ambassador for Lululemon mm. as well. Okay. They do some pretty amazing things. I got to go to Melbourne this year, Canada next year. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, and just bring awareness like I think I shared with you just before around that um Movember event I did. I wish I'd have met you, brother, because you would have been perfect <laughs> for that event. Next one, eh? Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, yes they, they're big on, especially for Movember, big on making sure that uh, they're supporting men and their health and well-being. Mm -hmm. I love your word, emotional fitness. Mm. I, I love I love how you speak about that. Mm. What does that mean to you? I'm asking the for questions me, yeah. now. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, like we were saying before about the, we, we learn so much, especially as a man, you know, the importance of uh, look after the body and, you know, doing exercise and, um, and all those things. But the, um, I think the most important thing is the, the ability to exercise how, because there's no one, I never learned this and I learned that after become an adult and after making so many mistakes and dealing as well with so much anger um but the tools to deal with my with my emotions and i think emotional fitness is something especially if, when you're an athlete when you practice a sport or you know yoga or something like that uh, you understand the power of a repetition you know in the in the practice and in the discipline involved mm -hmm. so um for me, the, the emotional fitness, it's something I can always get better because you, it, it, it's impossible to think about, oh, okay, I'm going to practice something, I'm going to become enlightened and that's <laughs> it, you know, that's me and I'm never going to be angry. It's rookie's mistake. Yeah, you know, so the idea of, a, it, it's like a fitness, you know, it's, a, it's always, it's about today, you know, it's uh, what I did yesterday, my friend, yeah, it's gone. No, it's about today, you know, what I'm doing right now. Yeah, and I think emotional fitness, we need to approach it this way. 
you know, it's every single day, it's one small step. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's that constantly work, 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 because it's never, it's never enough, right? It's never, we never have enough control of th those things. We can get better for sure, mm. but the practice of uh, um, stillness, dealing with silence, mm. um, I think silence, it's a very powerful tool, you know, when you sit and become quiet with your own thoughts, I think this give you so much freedom when you start to understand what's going on inside, what type of dialogue you have with yourself. <laughs> I think that's something so um, powerful to have. And I think uh, the more we talk about emotional fitness, it's something, it's open for everybody as well. It's not uh, everybody can, can, can get better you in, in, it. in fitness and, and emotionally as well, because we don't, uh, it's like a resilience. We don't born with this capacity, you know, it's something we exercise as a muscle. So I truly believe emotions, it's, it's that muscle we need to exercise a little bit more. I think, especially as a man, um, with this, this culture, as, as you explained yeah. so, so well before. And, and this is so deep on, on our behavior. And if we don't uh, practice something to bring some awareness through, through that, what type of behavior do I have? And, you know, for example, being, like you said, being stuck in the traffic, you know, so what type of behavior every time I'm stuck in the traffic that comes up and, you know, how I'm dealing with that? <laughs> I th yeah, you're right. And I like that traffic analogy because everyone can relate. To yes. That. It's also simple. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're by ourselves. So that's a time that we can practice it. Mm -hmm. Notice the conversation. Oh, shit, I wish this could be different. I wish people would hurry up and all I want to do is beep <laughs> out the horn. And But that's a, it's a chance to practice. Yeah. You know, we practice getting bigger muscles at the gym. Mm -hmm. We practice, you know, well, I heard this, I think I shared this in my TED Talk. We brush our teeth twice a day. Mm. Imagine if we focused on our mental health in the same way, four minutes a day whether that's sitting still and being quiet or yeah. meditating with a mantra or or walking meditation or just doing something that's mindful, mm -hmm. that's exercising, that's practicing uh, mental health and well-being. Yeah, and then just awareness, awareness around our emotions. And mm. I hate the word control because that's like a, it makes it, it's easier for us to give up if we yeah. if we are trying to control. Manage is the word that I use for emotions, mm -hmm. like managing yourself, meaning you've got to step almost step back and see. Oh, I'm getting angry. I'm mm. feeling that anger. Yeah, <laughs> and then you, and then you can literally manage because then then if you can see it, then you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's so powerful what you're doing with the kids because that's the beginning, and I think. Uh, um, you know, the next chapter, because I, I had the experience of going to, to prison to talk about mindfulness and meditation. And it was really interesting because the majority of the guys there came, I wish, I wish I knew that when I was a children, or I wish someone was doing that for my children out there, Yeah. you know, and, and you're doing that. And this is, this is very powerful. It makes me, um, uh, thank you makes me emotional because I think if our children had these tools, these mm. tools that I've learned as they've grown men that could have helped me when I was younger, that are helping these kids that I see now, that bully, for example, who has the knowledge now that his anger is going to hurt other people mm -hmm. and himself. But now has tools to be able to manage himself better if our children had that like they have maths that probably they'll never need <laughs> or or you know science and all those other things if that was part of how, what how, what the the tools that they put into their kit so that they can take it into life far out that would be such a i'd love to be able to offer that as a legacy that i leave mm -hmm. behind yeah for our children so just 
I would like to ask you so to wrap it up that what's do you have any quote you you live by or something represent uh, the message you'd like to to leave for for the people who are listening or watching us right now yeah it's gandhi's quote uh, was super simple but it really Im it's impactful for me because in everything that i do like you've explained i do many things but they're all in the same world mm -hmm. they're all to do with taking care of yourself holistically i suppose uh, is that I must, me, Jace, I must be an example of that. I can't be saying to people, take better care of your mental health if I'm not doing that myself. I can't be saying to people, be mindful when I'm in my mindful car with the labels, with my M3 labels, and I'm beeping the horn angrily at people. <laughs> I can't be there. I've got to be in the practice of that. So Gandhi's quote is, be the change you wish to see in the world. It's super simple but powerful. And I always think of that. I'm like, I want to be a walking, talking example of the thing that I'm asking people to consider. Like, like wow. you are. Mm. <laughs> oh, brother. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. You know, I finally uh, had the opportunity to meet you. I was aware of your work and. My friend, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the work you're doing. And I hope we, we can do some, some work together as well in the, in the future. Well, thank you so much. True pleasure, brother. <laughs> True.